If you ever visit the Australian Museum, you'll be greeted with displays containing the massive bones of long gone dinosaurs amongst the skins and skeletons of modern day animals. Look long enough though, and you may spot the remains of an animal both incredibly distant and tantalizingly close to our collective memory. The thylacine, known as the Carina to Indigenous Australians and Tasmanian tiger to the world at large, the last confirmed thylacine passed away in Hobart Zoo almost 100 years ago. But it's never really gone away though. People keep saying they've seen them, but undeniable proof of their survival is yet to emerge. The story of the thylacine, its life and decline, is one of tragedy, mystery, and perhaps hope. With a head and body resembling a dog, a rigid tail like a kangaroo, and tiger-like stripes running down its back and hind legs, the thylacine was an animal that looked strange and familiar all at once. When fully grown, it stood about 60 centimetres tall and weighed 20 kilos. And it was a truly special animal. Unlike most marsupials, the thylacine had pouches present in both sexes. The females had a rear-facing pouch with room for up to four joeys while the pouches of males protected their reproductive organs. No sound recordings of the thylacine are known to exist, although accounts from zookeepers, naturalists and others describe them uttering a variety of short low barks when feeling agitated or communicating with others and making a hissing sound when threatened. Some of them have even likened the thylacine's vocalizations to those of a terrier. We know the thylacine was a nocturnal carnivore, but how it hunted and even what it hunted continues to be debated amongst those who study it. Some suggest thylacines would single their prey out and chase it down like a cheetah, but accounts from thylacine trappers suggest it may have been an ambush predator, surprising its prey by bursting out of cover like a tiger. Based on early estimations of its size and bite strength, it was thought the thylacine could take down large prey like kangaroos, although more recent studies from UNSW have argued it was only capable of targeting animals smaller than itself, or at the very least had a strong preference for feeding on them. The thylacine first began appearing in the fossil record about 4 million years ago, and was known to have inhabited both Tasmania and mainland Australia, as well as parts of New Guinea. The indigenous population regularly encountered the thylacine, and its earliest depiction in rock art dates back several thousand years. About 3,000 years ago, thylacine populations began to decline, eventually leading them to be confined to Tasmania only. There is considerable debate about just what caused thylacine numbers to decrease on mainland Australia. Indigenous hunters certainly impacted their numbers, but it's also believed that climate change and the introduction of the dingo to Australia played a large part in the thylacine's mainland decline. Dingoes were larger and stronger than thylacines and hunted in packs allowing them to gain an edge when pursuing prey animals. It's also been theorised that female thylacines were killed by dingoes. Female thylacines were much smaller than males and an easier target for dingoes and their deaths would affect the reproduction rate of the thylacine species as a whole. The dingo never reached Tasmania though, which allowed the thylacine population on the island to thrive, at least until the arrival of Europeans. It's estimated that there were about 5,000 thylacines in Tasmania at the start of European settlement in the early 1800s. The island state quickly became overtaken by agriculture and was home to thousands upon thousands of sheep. The sheep made money for settlers and big businesses who did all they could to keep Tasmania's sheep farming industry alive and profitable. As farms began reporting sheep stock losses, blame was directed not to farmer and ineptitude nor the increasing wild dog population. It was the thylacine that was held responsible. The Tasmanian economy was almost entirely dependent on sheep farming and anything perceived as a threat had to be eradicated. So when the Van Diemen's Land Company introduced a bounty on the thylacine in the 1830s, it was taken up by farmers and non-farmers alike with enthusiasm. The Tasmanian government introduced an official thylacine bounty in 1888, which paid £1 for adults and 10 shillings for each pup killed. 
and some private bounties paid even more. Traps and snares were set up at the borders of farmer properties and bush areas thought to be frequented by thylacines, who were enticed by the kangaroo meat and bacon used as bait. At the time, shepherd wages amounted to barely five shillings a week. Capturing and killing thylacines was an easy choice for the average Tasmanian. By the time the government entered the scheme in 1909, well over 2,000 bounties had been paid out for dead thylacines. Today it's believed the effects of thylacines on sheet numbers were greatly exaggerated. Though hunting by humans undoubtedly played a part, the exact reasons behind the thylacine's extinction remain sources of mystery and contention. It's believed the loss of habitat and prey animals, combined with disease and competition from feral dogs and cats, were all contributing factors. Whatever the reasons for the decline were, it was clear that the thylacine survival as a species was under serious threat by the early 20th century, and zoos from across the world competed to obtain them for their collections. Some even hoped to breed them, but these attempts yielded poor results. All of the captive thylacines died, and by 1936, only one was left, held at Hobart Zoo. In a species already surrounded by questions, the last captive thylacine still has mysteries surrounding it. We're not entirely sure where or when it was captured, who caught it, or even if it was actually given a name. A man who claimed to be a former zookeeper at Hobart Zoo stated decades later that the thylacine was named Benjamin, although there's no official record of any name being given. Benjamin, the last of his kind, died on the 7th of September 1936, not from old age, disease or injury, but from human negligence. A caretaker let Benjamin's shelter locked overnight, and with no substantial protection from the elements available, Benjamin succumbed to the freezing conditions. The Tasmanian government had finally declared thylacines a protected species less than two months earlier, and perhaps fittingly, Hobart Zoo closed its doors a year later amid fallen attendance figures and accusations of cruel treatment towards its animals. At the time of Benjamin's death, it wasn't even recognised that he could have been the last thylacine. From 1937, newspapers began circulating articles asking if anyone had seen them in the wild and questioned if they had become extinct. Finally, in 1986, it was made official. The thylacine was no more. But it hasn't stopped the stories. Since Benjamin's death, there have been hundreds upon hundreds of thylacine sightings reported in Tasmania and the Australian mainland, with some occurring even before the official extinction declaration. Some sightings have been reported as fleeting encounters, though other recollections reveal far more detailed incidents. Rabbit trapper Bert Ma was in northwestern Tasmania in 1953 when he discovered something biting the heads off rabbits as they lay in his traps. Believing he was dealing with a dog, Ma set up a custom trap to catch the culprit and soon found he had snared a large animal. He hid it over the head and skinned it, and only after examining the skin did he realise that he may have caught a thylacine. When Tasmanian fauna authorities took a look at the animal's remains, they determined that Ma had captured a tiger cat. Forest ranger Hans Nardin was in the Tagari area of Tasmania when he observed what he thought was a thylacine early one autumn morning in 1982. The animal with a striped pattern on its fur was six metres in front of his land cruiser, soaking wet from the heavy rain, and Nardin noted it seemed to be a healthy male. After he reported the incident to his colleagues, Parks and Wildlife set up cameras in the area where the encounter had occurred, and undertook a two-year search for further evidence. An official government report considered that the location of Nardin's sighting could have been visited by thylacines on an irregular basis in 1982, but increased changes and disturbances meant that they'd be unlikely to return if they were ever in the area to begin with. In 1986, New Scientist magazine published photos taken in Western Australia by Indigenous tracker Kevin Cameron, depicting the tail, back and hind legs of an apparent thylacine digging a hole in the ground. Though there is some support in analysis to suggest the creature shown may be a thylacine, there have been doubts cast on Cameron's story, 
He claimed the encounter took place over a short period of time, while the movement of shadows in the photo seems to indicate much more time passing. Despite questions of authenticity surrounding the many accounts and photos such as these, scientists have undertaken multiple studies and seriously investigated the possibility that the thylacine did not die out with Benjamin. Between 1968 and 1972, Jeremy Griffith and James Malley conducted extensive searches of northwest and southwest Tasmania for evidence of the thylacine. With the help of future Greens leader Bob Brown, the team set up snares to catch the animal and investigated possible footprints and lairs. Their efforts saw them travel hundreds of kilometres each week and offered a $100 reward for any thylacine prints. In 1980, the World Wildlife Fund contributed $55,000 to a National Parks and Wildlife Service investigation to find evidence of the thylacine in the wilds of Tasmania. Over six months, Parks and Wildlife staff set up cameras on known animal trails near where the sightings had been reported. Beyond these and other on-the-ground efforts, a study by a team at the University of Tasmania analysed over 1,000 alleged thylacine sightings reported between 1910 and 2019, giving each a credibility rating and compiling them into a database. The study concluded that thylacines most likely went extinct between the 1980s and early 2000s. According to their research, if the thylacine still exists, it would most likely be located in western and southwestern Tasmania. This study is yet to be peer-reviewed. The chances of the thylacine's existence today may be slim, but it's still possible that Benjamin was not the last of them. At the very least, farmers may have still shot thylacines in the aftermath of the government protection order, but didn't report their encounters out of fear of heavy fines. Beyond this small window, other factors still raise questions over thylacines being viable today. In the wake of the bounties and increased habitat destruction in the early 20th century, Thylacines may have become much more scattered, and those remaining would have difficulty finding each other at the right time to breed. Even then, with such a small population left, the possibility of inbreeding would rise and result in a lack of genetic diversity, which would lead to a heightened probability of extinction. All of the studies, searches, camera technology improvements, and continued public interest have yet to produce reliable evidence of the thylacine surviving today. No photo, no video, no track, no body. Even so, the thylacine wouldn't be the first animal to be rediscovered after being declared extinct. The likes of the New Guinea sinning dog, Kashmir musk deer, and even Australia's own Gilbert's potteroo were all thought to be extinct, only to be found alive but in a critically endangered state decades later. Perhaps the thylacine will one day join their ranks. And even if no thylacines still walk the wilds of Tasmania today, it doesn't necessarily mean they never will again. There have been various thylacine resurrection initiatives since the late 1990s, and though many of these have fallen apart, projects continue to be worked on today. One of the most promising of these efforts is a gene editing project at the University of Melbourne. Headed up by Professor Andrew Pask, the team has already completed some of the steps which they believe could lead to the thylacine being revived. A complete genome, also known as a genetic blueprint of the thylacine, has been mapped, as have those of some of the thylacine's closest relatives, such as the Dunart and the Numbat. From there, it's a process involving identifying and editing the differences between the sets of genomes and producing an embryo to implant into a surrogate animal which can give birth to a healthy thylacine joey. Compared to other long-extinct animals like the woolly mammoth, thylacines have a far better chance of being brought back. The thylacine genetic material available to us is of better quality, and the changes to the environment since the thylacine's extinction are not as drastic as those that have taken place since the demise of the mammoth. The resurrected thylacines could survive in today's world and play a sustainable role in their ecosystem. Regardless of the mystery surrounding its life, extinction, and whether it can or should be brought back through genetics, we can learn from the thylacine story. 
people's actions toward the environment can have drastic consequences when left unchecked, and species all over the globe continue to be at risk. Australia alone has 1,700 animals that are classified as threatened. Some like the koala, the numbat, and quokka are easily recognised, while others like the southern bentwing bat, white-throat snapping turtle, and smooth handfish have little if any public awareness about them. All of them deserve a chance to survive and thrive, and avoid the same fate as the thylacine. Thanks for watching this video. If you're finding me for the first time, I look at different mysteries and history, as well as true crime and other topics I find interesting with something strange about them. I focus on Australia, at least for now, because that's where I'm from, but I may look at other places in the future. If you're someone that caught my iceberg video, you may remember me saying that I would give some entries their own dedicated video. Well, here's the first one of them. I don't know what I'm going to tackle next, but I'm glad I did this one. The story of the thylacine is a topic that I've wanted to cover for quite a while now, and I hope I've done it justice, and I hope maybe you've even learned something new you didn't know, because I certainly found out some new things as I was researching this. And let me know what you think about the idea of de-extincting the thylacine. Should we de-extinct it? Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you for the next one. And be good to yourselves.